Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. And I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, with COVID-19 cases falling, Quebec prepares for an opening step. With all the, the problems regarding vaccine and virus, it is a very risky uh, moment. But in many provinces, concern with variants is on the rise. We probably are going to need an annual shot, or some of us are going to need an annual shot. Canada prepares to make vaccines at home. Vladimir Putin's harshest critic is sent to prison. And Saskatchewan in mourning. She gave hope to people who didn't necessarily have it at the time. Dion Warner's life of grace, her death with dignity. This is The National. Well, tonight, across much of Canada, two portraits of COVID-19 are emerging. One shows a slowing pandemic and cautious talk of economic reopening. And the other shows a rise in variant cases and worried talk of where that might lead. Many provinces looking at both pictures have a choice to make. And tonight, we look at where those threatening variants are and how fast they're spreading. But first, the debate about taking an opening step as cases across Canada continue to drop and the tidal wave of hospitalizations rolls back. Today, Quebec announced an easing of some safety protocols. Alison Northcott looks at the timing, the reasoning and the reaction. Amir Hussein's clothing store has been closed to customers since Christmas Day. Inventory is barely moving and his business is hurting. To open my doors again, uh, I've been waiting uh, for this moment uh, since a long time. The situation has improved in recent weeks. With the number of new cases declining, the Quebec government announced some public health measures will soon be lifted. It's calculated risk. Uh, and it's a balance also taking into consideration mental health uh, uh, and also the situation that uh, we are in since 11 months. Hello. Starting next week, non-essential stores, hair salons and museums can reopen and college and university students could soon gradually return to in-person classes. The 8 p.m. curfew, in effect for nearly a month now, remains. But in some regions with few active cases, it will be pushed back to 9.30. Restaurants and gyms in those regions can reopen too, with restrictions. It is very different for, from the situation of the largest centers. Catherine Jourdain manages a shopping mall on Quebec's North Shore. Most of the businesses in it are closed, despite only a handful of active cases in the region. There's nobody. Restaurants are closed. It's really sad. So it will be a big relief for the shopping centers. In other areas like Montreal, the situation is improving but fragile. And some experts say relaxing measures could threaten that. With all the, the problems regarding vaccine and virus, it is a very risky uh, moment. I would have waited a few more weeks. But the government is trying to strike a balance now while it has some control on the virus, says this epidemiologist. All governments are struggling to uh, make uh, all the other components of the life outside COVID-19 to be able to, uh, to, to resume as much as possible while maintaining, again, the healthcare system. And so, Alison, the, the loosening up plan seems to look different in bigger population centres. What's the thinking there? Well, the province says keeping some of the measures in some of the more populated areas that have more cases is necessary to protect the health care system. And the premier says that's part of the reason why some restaurants won't be able to reopen yet and why the curfew will remain in place. But some experts that we've spoken with say that the curfew is just one of a combination of measures that have likely helped to bring case numbers down. All right. Thank you, Alison. Alison Northcott in a snowy Montreal tonight. Okay, now following along all of this, uh, we have epidemiologist Ray Watt Dionandon. And to start, can you just give us your quick take on the easing of restrictions? Is it too soon or now is a good time? Well, first, it's not just a public health issue. It's also an economics issue, a public education issue, and an issue regarding public tolerance. So from a strictly public health perspective, it probably is a bit too early, especially since the cases are coming down, but we're still above what the peak of the first wave was, and we have the threat of a new variance. Having said that, if we're going to do it, 
you have to do it uh, probably in a strategic manner. The regional approach is probably well-founded because it has the greater public buy-in and probably uh, more easily managed from a from an administrative perspective. Right, which, which kind of leads me to my next question. If Quebec or, or any other province for that matter does loosen restrictions, what is it that you would want to see happen in conjunction with that to, to mitigate the risk as much as possible? We need a lot more public health infrastructure in various institutions like workplaces and schools. We need constant surveillance, especially asymptomatic surveillance. Let's use our rapid testing capacity to that end. Otherwise, we're not really sure which maneuvers, which moves, which institutions are driving community transmission. Surveillance, surveillance, surveillance. Okay, Ray Watt, you and joining us. And we're going to talk to you a little bit later in the program as well about variants. Uh, so we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so with a slower than expected Canadian vaccine rollout, let's look at where these COVID-19 variants are and what's being done to track their spread. Catherine Cullen looks at that part of the puzzle tonight. Dr. Jennifer Russell had warned it was coming soon. Well, that day has arrived and we can confirm now that there is um, the UK variant of COVID-19 in our province. How serious is it? She says for most of January, New Brunswick saw 567 cases of COVID. If the variant first reported in the UK had been present, even by a low estimate, that would have put the province at just over 1,000 cases. By the end of this month, more than 6,000. And if this strain, when the strain gets into our population, it'll be very difficult to get ahead of it and stay ahead of it. In other provinces, the problem is further advanced, like Ontario. So this is the classic case of the horses out of the barn. It's here, it's been here probably for weeks or perhaps even longer, and it's transmitting within the community. In Alberta, the variant first reported by the UK could take over by March 7th, predicts this researcher. Even if we don't reopen, basically if we don't make restrictions more strict, then, then it will, the, the variant will become dominant. Federal public health officials acknowledge there are more variant cases in Canada than are being detected. They say the screening process is still being ramped up. Canada um, is testing uh, for variants uh, more than other countries, but we, we can definitely improve on that. Nationally, officials say about 5% of COVID cases are being tested for variants. The goal is to double that up to 10% and get faster results. The improvements are expected to take weeks. But the ways to stop any version of the virus haven't changed. Follow public health restrictions. I think the message is really um, hang on in there for a bit longer. Vigilance and caution, she says, are key. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, in the UK, concern about variants is twofold. There's concern the mutation first detected there is mutating again, but also that new variants could follow. So health officials are racing to implement a new testing program there alongside their vaccine rollout. Renee Filipponi explains. Hello, we're from Volunteers go door to door, offering COVID tests to everyone, even the asymptomatic in a race to control variants of the virus. We'll come back and collect it in a couple of hours' time. This program is targeting 80,000 people across England, where the variant from South Africa has been found. There are two positive cases in this community. They haven't been in contact with anybody, as far as we know, that's been to South Africa. So we just want to see whether or not it is actually spreading. We have to come down on it hard. Our mission must be to stop its spread altogether. The UK is also struggling to control its own fast-spreading variant, first found in the southeast, but has now mutated again, found in a couple of clusters where infection rates are high. It is a really concerning change that we're seeing in the UK right now. This epidemiologist says the mutation makes it similar to strains found in South Africa and Brazil, which may reduce the effectiveness of vaccines. It really highlights the potential of this virus to adapt in many different places, leading to the same mutations popping up again and again through different parts, suggesting that these are in some way favorable to the virus. When it comes to the new variants, experts say vaccines still appear to prevent severe COVID. The push to inoculate is a priority. 10 million doses have been given already in the UK. Let's get everybody immunized. That makes a huge difference. These variants, you can't really hold them back. You can slow them by having border controls, but all the experience is that eventually they arrive. 
unwelcome news for those weary of lockdown. Obviously, it's uh, of concern, but I've been very careful about um, staying at home. A concern shared by the government, chasing after a virus that appears to have changed yet again. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. Well, the Canadian government says new shipments of vaccines have begun to arrive in Canada this week, despite new controls on exports by the European Union. Echoing assurances Canada says it's received, a European Commission spokesperson told CBC News today, Canada is aware that the EU has the duty to ensure that our citizens are vaccinated as soon as possible. At the same time, we do not want to deprive other countries from their own much-needed vaccines, in particular if these countries do not have their own manufacturing capacity. And so, on that last point, change could be coming. Today, the Prime Minister announced a plan to produce some COVID-19 vaccines in Canada. But as David Cochran explains, it will take time to get there. As Canada struggles to get vaccines from abroad, a plan to start making them at home. Pending Health Canada approval, tens of millions of Novavax COVID-19 doses will be made right here at home. It's a step towards a domestic vaccine source, but it's months away from paying off. The Novavax vaccine is still under review by Health Canada. The facility in Montreal isn't built yet, and once it is, it will need Health Canada approval too. Then Novavax has to scale up and deliver. We expect by the end of the year um, uh, to be in a position uh, to be producing vaccines. But that end-of-year timeline won't speed up Canada's vaccine rollout, where the goal is full vaccination by September. Though it does provide longer-term security against a virus that is mutating and far from contained. I don't see this pandemic or this virus going away by September. Uh, we, we probably are going to need an annual shot, or some of us are going to need an annual shot. The opposition argues it took too long to get to this starting point. We are frustrated by Justin Trudeau and the Liberals' failure to secure and get vaccines into the arms of Canadians. While this is good news and it is a positive thing to produce the vaccine in Canada, it is very late. But the government insists existing vaccine contracts will cover the short term. These measures are for the long term. Whether it's for uh, further waves of uh, this virus or it's for future viruses. The government is also investing in vaccine production in Saskatchewan and British Columbia, but that's for 2022 or even 2023, meaning they pay off in the late stages of this pandemic or the early stages of the next one. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. There was a boost for Russia's Sputnik V COVID vaccine today. New data published in The Lancet show it's about 91% effective. That is based on a trial of about 20,000 people in Russia. It appears to prevent severe illness, but it's not clear whether it stops transmission. Russia approved it back in August when it had only been tested on dozens of people, leading to a lot of criticism and skepticism. Well, Canada is among a number of countries calling for the release of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny. One of Vladimir Putin's fiercest critics, Navalny says he's been sentenced to prison because the president is afraid of him. Chris Brown has more from Moscow. The fact State TV was let in as a judge read out the verdict against Alexei Navalny tells you the Kremlin wanted every Russian to see Vladimir Putin's arch foe sent to prison. Instead, Navalny drew the outline of a heart to his wife, Yulia. Earlier, without the cameras, he delivered a searing indictment against Putin. It drives that little thieving man in his bunker crazy, who I offended by surviving when he tried to have me killed, said Navalny. Jail me, he went on, to scare tens of millions of others. The police response again today was repressive. The neighborhood around the courthouse was swarming with riot police, just in case anyone came to support Navalny. Here at the closest metro station, police are literally detaining any young person who comes out of the metro, even if they don't say or do anything, just in case they might be trying to get to the courthouse. 
Navalny, a lawyer turned anti-corruption crusader, has infuriated the Kremlin elite with his exposés and their obscene wealth and spending. He's been harassed and prosecuted repeatedly, but Navalny told the judge today's verdict was the most absurd of all. It replaced a suspended sentence from an earlier case with two years, eight months of hard labor, all because he was in a coma after an assassination attempt and couldn't check in with parole officers. His lawyers, along with his wife Yulia, said they plan to appeal, but it's hard to see that amounting to much. Navalny's decision to go to jail for his beliefs has broadened his appeal and shaken Russia's leadership. But where things go from here is uncertain. The Putin government sees Navalny as a traitor to be crushed. And tonight, Moscow again is a city on a war footing. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. Joe Biden signed executive orders today on U.S. immigration specifically to reunite migrant families torn apart of the border. Two weeks into his presidency, it is a signal of his priorities. But as Katie Simpson tells us, bigger changes won't be as easy as signing a piece of paper. At a brisk clip, the president is chipping Nobody away at his predecessor's fire. policies. We're going to work to undo the moral and national shame of the previous administration that literally, not figuratively, ripped children from the arms of their families. Joe Biden signed three more executive orders, one to review and eventually eliminate Trump-era immigration policies, another to study the root causes of migration, and an order that creates a new task force with the sole purpose of tracking down the parents of the remaining 600 or so kids separated from their families under Donald Trump's zero-tolerance migrant policy. It was traumatizing, um, certainly traumatizing for the children. Jody Goodwin helped reunite hundreds of families separated by that policy and says the trauma does not go away. The moms will call me and um, ask me for advice and resource help um, to try to get psychological care for their children who still have nightmares and wake up screaming at night. While the president can use executive orders to repeal policies, substantive change will require new laws passed by Congress. But immigration and border security are considered such divisive issues, it will be difficult to build support, even with Democrats controlling the House, the Senate and the White House. I suspect the same political fights will occur that have always occurred, but I think the country is tired of some of those really racist, xenophobic policies that the Trump administration enacted. The Senate served as a fresh reminder of existing divisions, with a vote nearly down partisan lines to confirm the new Secretary of Homeland Security, who will play a significant role in immigration policy. One of their biggest challenges ahead will be reuniting families. Many of the parents have been deported, and there are few records documenting the details. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Well, one of the world's richest people, Jeff Bezos, is stepping down as the CEO of Amazon, a company he founded nearly 30 years ago. In a note to employees, Bezos says he plans to leave the job in the fall, becoming the board's executive chair. He says he wants to focus instead on charitable projects. His replacement will be Andy Jassy, who currently runs Amazon's cloud computing business. So the pandemic has left many of us looking for inspiration. That is exactly what Captain Tom Moore gave to an entire nation and beyond. So sad news today then, that the Second World War veteran has died after testing positive for COVID-19. But as Margaret Evans reminds us, he raised millions and lifted spirits too. From the confines of an English country garden, Captain Tom Moore made a beeline for the heart of this country with each careful step on his walker far surpassing his original aim of raising just a thousand pounds for the National Health Service as it fought COVID-19 and achieving national hero status along the way. Thank you very much, all of you throughout the world. But in the end, he was diagnosed with COVID-19 after a bout of pneumonia. He died in hospital, surrounded by his family. The Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, led the tributes. He became not just a national inspiration, but a beacon of hope for the world. Our thoughts today are with his daughter Hannah and all his family, and his legacy will long live after him.
Born in 1920, he fought in Burma during the Second World War. His feat of raising millions for healthcare workers has been celebrated in a special postmark, his own birthday fly pass, the gratitude of an entire nation, and the Queen, who made him a knight of the realm, but not before a little trademark humor. If I kneel down, I'll never get up again. Despite the twinkle in his eye, he offered a serious and much needed message of hope. Tonight, many were laying flowers in his memory. We're gutted, really gutted. Uh, it's just such an inspiration and such a really sad time. For many here, the image of his frail figure, doggedly walking laps, came to symbolize the strength of the human spirit, of goodwill and generosity and perseverance. The sun will shine on you again and the clouds will go away. They are words, no doubt, he would have hoped will live on without him. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. And just a note on this, at, at 100 years old, you would have thought he would have been first in line for the vaccine, right. but, you know, it's another of COVID cruel, cruelties that he wasn't able to get it because of pneumonia right. medication he was on. Yeah, well, it's a sad ending to, to a story that was full of goodness, as we've been reminded. Uh, next, a glimmer of hope after a very long year. We were blessed to have the vaccinations so you could see the joy on residents' faces. The new normal inside a long-term care home where nearly everyone is now vaccinated. There is a lot of talk about variants right now. I know that some people are also feeling information overload. The doctors are here to help us figure out what's likely to change in our lives now that the variants are here. And you're not the only one with that Groundhog Day feel. I feel like a hamster in a hamster wheel. Tips to break that pandemic deja vu. We're back in two. Ontario is pushing back its target date to finish giving first vaccinations to those living in long-term care homes, as well as other high-priority groups. It blames delayed vaccine shipments. I can't stress how frustrating that is. The province hopes to complete that initial round by February 10th. That's five days later than planned. As of yesterday, 344,000 first shots have been delivered, with about 72,000 Ontarians having received both doses. Well, after four outbreaks and the loss of 13 residents to COVID-19, one of Ontario's largest long-term care homes is trying to find a new normal. With almost all of the residents having received both vaccine doses now, Ottawa's Pearly and Rideau Veterans Health Centre is letting people grieve and adapt. Julie Ireton got a rare look inside. Okay, you ready? For what? For your vaccination? Oh. <laughs> it's going to keep you safe from COVID. 96-year-old Bill Silver is a veteran of the Second World War, and he just got his second dose of the COVID vaccine. Yay, all done! Well, I hardly, hardly, hardly knew what happened. CBC News was allowed into this non-profit veteran's care home as nurses were going room to room administering booster shots. Almost all the residents have now been fully vaccinated against COVID-19. Most of the staff as well. We were blessed to have the vaccinations so you could see the joy on residents' faces. Laurent Aubin, a Navy veteran, moved into this facility just before the pandemic hit. Then lockdown began. It's a very confining at the beginning, you know. I stay in my room most of the time. I exercise, I read every day. I look forward to it when I get up. See, so this is gonna day that we're gonna be able to go to, into the community. Je suis seul. Vaccinations are helping boost spirits. Music therapy and other programs stopped during outbreaks, but are now back on, just being adapted. All right, Terry, you know the drill. Weekly COVID tests for staff will continue indefinitely, but after 11 grueling months of the pandemic, administrators say there's finally a feeling of hope here. There is definitely something different, and I think some of that is absolutely due to the vaccine, but I also think that we're starting to get our heads around how we actually help people live and to work in a meaningful way in the middle of all of this. 
There are still more than 220 active COVID outbreaks in long-term care homes across Ontario. The pandemic exposed unsettling conditions and has drawn attention to the whole sector. I think absolutely the attention that's placed on long-term care is critical to some system changes that are required to move forward with caring for seniors in the future. Residents here still can't leave the building and few visitors are allowed in. And COVID precautions aren't over yet. But thanks to the vaccine, staff are finally able to do more to make life inside more bearable. Julie Ayrton, CBC News, Ottawa. The feeling of being cut off from support networks is weighing heavily on Canadians of every age group. As part of our series, Out of the Dark, CBC Montreal spoke with young Quebecers about how they are handling the loneliness. I feel like I just want to get close to my friends. I can't wait to give a group hug. <sighs> I just think about it and it gives me so much like nostalgic feelings because I really miss human connections. Before you could just go to an event and you know like so and so was gonna be there, but now uh, since this is not happening anymore, you have to be like intentional uh, in like who you want to reach out to, who you want to like speak to on the phone or whatever. So there's like this kind of like solitude attached to the whole thing that you can't really shake off. I love school. I love going there. I love, you know, feeling the vibe, you know, like being with people and everything, but not being able to socialize or even be close to other people. I feel like I didn't have any connection and I, I didn't feel a part of something. I think a lot of the time uh, measures are put in place and then a lot of the ways that it impacts youth are, are kind of an, an afterthought. And a lot of like young professionals, a lot of youth are just kind of left scrambling to figure out how to adjust with very little direction and very little guidance. So this was really my first year at university. So I didn't come into this already having school friends. I didn't come into this knowing classmates from other classes. So I think that's what the hardest, uh, that's what the hardest part has been. And especially as someone who doesn't necessarily know how to navigate the different resources at a new school, I think having to kind of figure that out on my own has also been uh, one of the more difficult and kind of isolating parts of it. It hasn't been eliminated or removed from your life, right? That, that ability to connect and to contact, it's just caused you to have to change the way in which you go about it, change the sources in which you receive it from. Whether it's Zoom calls, whether it's FaceTiming, whether it's chats over social media, for a lot of youth, it's through gaming, but like maintaining a way of still being able to engage in the things that you would define as passions, the things that kind of anchor you to your reality or your present, the things that nourish who you are and, and your character. For the past year, I've been putting a lot of things um, as if it was okay, or just being like tolerant of things, just trying to like push things away and thinking, oh, if I take care of things around me, I guess it's fine. Um, but turns out if you forget yourself in this pandemic, you kind of like see that this could really take a big effect on you faster than you would think. At the end of the day, it's not everyone else that's going to save you from the pandemic emotionally, physically or whatever. It's yourself. I guess a little bit comforting to know that if you speak your mind and speak about how you're feeling, other people won't look at you and think like, what is she talking about? Because everyone's going through the same weird and horrible thing and we can all, I guess, be together about it. I think there's been a solid amount of solidarity among youth lately. Misery loves company, I guess, but kind of in a way that's, that's optimistic. Even if things are difficult, even if uh, some of the advocacy stuff can, can be tough because um, people don't necessarily want to listen, uh, it's nice to know that you're not alone in doing it, that other people uh, feel the same way that they're also trying to, to have their voices heard. And I, I guess deep down, uh, that keeps me optimistic. That keeps me hoping for, hoping for a better future and also sort of working for a better future for youth. We're all, <laughs> it's going to sound kind of corny, but like we're all kind of in this together and it's important that like we know that and we don't just like, I'm also talking to myself when I say this, but like, you know, we don't just like isolate and 
wait for, you know, I'm going to wait for someone to reach out to me or I'm going to just like do my own thing in my own bubble. Like we really need each other more than ever right now. And that was part of our series, Out of the Dark, Real Talk on Mental Health, a project by CBC Quebec. You can visit cbc.ca slash out of the dark as we examine isolation during the pandemic. And there you'll also find resources to help you cope. If you are in crisis or you know someone who is, you can get help by calling the Canada Suicide Prevention Service at 1-833-456-4566. Okay, coming up next, we're going to take a hard look at what actually changes in Canada with the coronavirus variants taking root, even if cases continue to go down. And later, are the days all starting to sort of blend together a little? I think it'll be an early spring. Didn't we do this yesterday? Right, exactly. Why a lot of us are getting that Groundhog Day feeling and an easy way to break that lockdown monotony. Welcome back. The number of daily COVID-19 cases in Canada has been going down for weeks now. That's good news. But even today's low is far higher than it was back in the spring and the summer when we were locked down with less than half the daily cases we see these days. Now, granted, we have greater hospital capacity to accommodate higher case rates. We also have a much better understanding of the virus than we did back then. But those variants making their way around the world now have injected new uncertainty. So even with declining daily cases, how might the variants change things for Canadians? Well, let's figure it out with infectious diseases specialist Dr. Lenora Saxinger, also epidemiologist Ray Watt Dionandon joining us. Uh, Dr. Saxinger, let's start with you because we keep hearing two things about the variants, right? One, that they're potentially more contagious, maybe more dangerous, but also two, that they don't really fundamentally change what the average Canadian should do to protect themselves. So what do those variants really change? Well, I think that it is kind of funny that we're saying that, you know, these are in fact more transmissible and so let's do the same thing. I think I would amend that to say we should do the same thing better. We should do the same thing harder. Um, the same measures um, can reduce spread, but it's more challenging to contain. And so the basics have to be done like just pristinely and people who have gotten a little more relaxed should be a little less relaxed now, honestly, to help contain this. And Ray Watt, do you see things the same way? Oh, absolutely. For me, there are two big takeaways. First is that the stakes got much higher in terms of lack of compliance to public health guidance. And second, this really accelerates the timeline for vaccination. So we have to use our mitigation tools to buy us more time to acquire more vaccine supply to harden our most vulnerable population against these new variants. Right, because Dr. Saxinger, the fear is what exactly? That that if, if you know, restrictions are, are eased in some places, that the variants could get more out of control than what we're, I guess, familiar with? Well, I mean, what we've seen in other places is that, you know, with certain restrictions in place, if the variants take over, they actually will continue to change your epidemic curve in the wrong direction very quickly. And so you need much stronger and more stringent restrictions to control them. So you don't want to get behind that. You want to be in front of it. Raywa, do, do the new travel restrictions in this country go the distance in helping control the spread of these variants? They may not be the biggest bang for a buck, but there's something and they're important. So it matters how many cases we are importing. If it's a handful, those handful become dozens down the transmission chain, maybe even hundreds. It matters that we're importing people through only a handful of airports. That way we prevent importing and seeding cases in parts of the country where the variant doesn't yet exist. It's also important that we don't export our cases to other countries, perhaps poor countries without the healthcare infrastructure to deal with this epidemic of a new variant. So all of this is quite important. Okay. Okay, and, and, and Dr. Saxinger, what, one thing that I've been sort of wondering in my head is, is what is the point at which we would reconsider some of the really basic stuff that we know about this pandemic? So like six feet for physical distancing, uh, whether we should all be wearing two or, I don't know, more masks or medical grade masks. What's your sense of that? Well, I think it should be on the table that we would, you know, take new evidence and act accordingly. And at the moment, I would basically take a very precautionary stance that if you can limit your contacts more, or stay a greater distance away and use a higher um, quality of mask, that those are good things to do right now. 
I would hesitate to make those like a mandated part of what we do until we actually see evidence of why it is that these are more infectious. Um, but at the moment, I think just trying to do those things very, very well is a very reasonable thing to do. Right. So, so if I'm understanding you correctly, we, we don't understand enough about how those mutations and variants behave themselves to, to recommend specific changes, like, like shortening the distance we, we keep from other people. Exactly. I mean, we don't know whether it's a different dose of the virus, whether it's a longer um, period that it's transmissible. So there, there's a number of different things that could be at play, and designing a way to prevent that specifically would really require that information. But in the meantime, those basics we know prevent transmission. Raywat, is Canada doing a good enough job tracking and understanding the scale of the variant problem in this country? We can always do more, and I think we're doing what we can. So a percentage of the positive PCR tests undergo deeper genomic investigation, and the PCR tests themselves, a, a hand-waving approach is sometimes used looking at the gene targets to get a sense of whether or not we're actually detecting the new variants. Future variants, though, may not be detectable in this manner. And so to me, it underlines a need to continue to invest in surveillance resources going forward. And Dr. Saxinger, maybe one last question, and, and I fear this is maybe a dumb question, but why is it important for us to know the extent to which the variants have taken hold in the community in the sense that like like what's an example where having that information would fundamentally change the way we deal with the pandemic or, or change our approach to it well right now a lot of places are seeing some success with our measures in reducing case rates and places are starting to eye opening up further and reducing restrictions if we knew, for example, that there were community-based transmission events related to the new variants, and we knew that in advance of it really taking off our epidemic curve, I think we would really responsibly have to rethink what we want to do for reopening until we have a really good idea of the landscape of what's happening with the variants. Uh, Dr. Saxinger, Raywat Dionandan, thank you so much for your time. Thanks. Thank you. Ahead, it is Groundhog Day in every way. Can't even tell the difference between Saturday or Monday. I feel like a hamster in a hamster wheel. So does it feel like you're inside the movie, living the same day over and over again? Some expert tips on how to handle it. Next. Well, a winter storm slammed the Maritimes today, knocking out power in some places and closing some schools and businesses. Anywhere from 10 to 45 centimeters of snow was expected to fall, the biggest amount in northern New Brunswick. So you can imagine, people were listening pretty closely to what Nova, so Nova Scotia's Shubenacadie Sam had to say on this Groundhog Day. I don't see a shadow, do you, Julie? No shadow. No shadow. I believe that means an early spring, Sam. So that is how you make friends on a stormy day. Now, not all the groundhogs agreed today. Punxsutawney Phil took a contrarian view, but let's just hope this year he just got it wrong. So Groundhog Day either makes you think of rodents or a movie that these days is feeling a little more like reality. Greg Ross with some expert tips on how to deal with this pandemic monotony. I want to welcome you to the 65th annual Wyart and Willie Prediction Morning. In Ontario Cottage Country this morning, home of Wyart and Willie, a scaled back Groundhog Day celebration and some good news. It's an early spring. But away from the ceremony, people aren't just waiting for the winter to end. They want pandemic restrictions to end as well because it's all starting to feel a little too much like, well, Groundhog Day. In the movie, Bill Murray's character kept reliving the same day over and over. In real life, some are starting to feel like that's their reality. Can't even tell the difference between Saturday or Monday. I feel like a hamster in a hamster wheel. And people are getting sick of the routine. Every day I wake up, I make a coffee, I have a protein smoothie, I do yoga. I walk dogs, I get home, <laughs> I try to think about what to eat for dinner. <laughs> And I go to sleep early. As frustrating as this all is, experts say things haven't really changed as much as people may think. Our routines before the pandemic lockdown were also not changing very much. He says the difference is we no longer have as many distractions. We could go out of our office and get a coffee whenever we wanted, or we could go and chat to our office mates whenever we wanted. And those things have been taken away from us. So 
it does feel a lot more constrained, a lot more monotonous. And there are things we can do to try and beat the boredom. There's a great quote um, from Andy Warhol. That it's, it's, you need to let the little things that ordinarily bore you suddenly thrill you. So if you could find interest and curiosity and, and excitement in the little things in your life, then I think you'll be able to keep boredom at bay. It's lovely. And if that doesn't work, you could always try to get Andy McDowell to fall in love with you. No matter what happens tomorrow or for the rest of my life, I'm happy now. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. I guess that's, that's one way to do it. Uh, okay, we have a lot more ahead tonight, including the moment, but first, a lesson in living life to the fullest. Even though she had cancer, she never gave it the power to change the way she looked at life. Deanne Warner faced cancer for 25 years and inspired others along the way. Her incredible legacy right after the break. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, Alberta's inquiry into anti-oil and gas campaigns is mired by delays, legal action, and accusations of peddling climate denialism and conspiracy theories. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. A Saskatchewan woman who fought cancer nine times over 25 years has died. Dion Warner was a fierce advocate for cancer patients. She was loved and respected for how much courage she showed in her own fight. And in the end, she died on her own terms, choosing a medically assisted death. Bonnie Allen tells us more about her. There are many ways to describe Dion Warner. Brave, inspiring, sassy, and stubborn, too. The 55-year-old was determined that she would choose her final moments, not cancer. Let's face it, she's not suffering anymore, and she, she got to go out on her own terms. Kelly Greenwood was at her friend's bedside yesterday when Warner died with medical assistance. Greenwood, who also had cancer, says Warner dealt with each of her nine cancer diagnoses with just one day of sadness. She would feel sad and have some tears, and, and then once that 24 hours was over, she would say, okay, it's time to pick myself up and get going. And, and then she'd say, why not me? I can do this. Warner was first diagnosed with breast cancer 25 years ago at age 30. It went into remission, then came back eight more times in different parts of her body, including her brain, lung, and liver. She shared her journey publicly. Life is so precious every day is so special and you know what you have to celebrate it every single day she and her husband graham did that with flair often dancing their way into chemotherapy wearing costumes because we thought everybody's just loving this and we're having so much fun friends were saying have fun at chemo warner also volunteered at the cancer clinic and that's where bernie felix met her during his chemotherapy treatment even though she had cancer she never gave it the power to change the way she looked at life. She gave hope to people who didn't necessarily have it at the time. Um, she gave it to herself. But in December, her cancer spread to the point death was unavoidable. Her husband, Graham, said a medically aided death allowed Warner to depart with grace, dignity and comfort. He and her friends want Warner's hope to live on in others. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. And next on The National, one young girl shakes up her school library. How this 13-year-old is adding diversity one book at a time. That's next in our moment. <laughs> Sophia Rathjen is in grade 8 and she loves to read, but she was really bothered by how the books in her school library consisted mostly of white authors. So the 13-year-old set out to add diversity to her school library, book by book, over 100 books, actually, and how she did it is tonight's moment. This is the first 39 books of 134 that I purchased uh, through a $2,000 grant through the uh, Strathcona County. The library was great. It just, I noticed that it lacked representation of people of color, and I saw the way that it affected outside of the library and outside of books uh, with my school. So I just thought about how I could change that. 
And I felt so excited that I was going to be able to share all these amazing books with my school. Just knowing that I, this was actually going to be happening, like something that I'd been talking about and thinking about for a long time, that it was actually going to be a thing. And all people of color can see their stories represented authentically and unapologetically um, and written by authors who understand those experiences. I hope everyone reads these books. Yeah, we hope so too. And, and I, I love the part of the story because history is obviously a big component of this in terms of the range that those books cover. But there's also a lot of poetry, sci-fi, mythology, all of it mixed in. Fantastic. And th this is a stone that's that's rolling, mm, right? Because right. when people have started to hear what she was doing, she's now getting offers saying, you get the books, we'll get the bookshelves. <laughs> and so it goes. So that is a national for Groundhog Day, February mm. the 2nd, tonight. Good night.